right, I want to welcome you again to another service. Let me, uh, if you would, I want you to go to 1 John chapter 3 and uh, verse uh, 4. We're going to be reading. I want to talk to you on a simple subject, and that is simply this. The, the thought of what sin does to a Christian. What sin does to a Christian. I want you to notice here the Bible says, Whosoever committed sin transgresses the law, for sin is a transgression of the law. Now, I want you to consider you and I as Christians, when we get saved, when we and I uh, hear the gospel, we give our life to the Lord Jesus Christ, right there and then, now we, be, be, we belong to the body of Christ. We are now have been baptized through the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ. Now we are part of His body. And so we have to consider that the Bible teaches you and I that, uh, that we have been bought with a price. God has uh, taken you and I, and he has bought us with, with a price, and that price is the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, and of course, 1 Corinthians 7 and verse 23. Uh, there's some, that the Bible says in 2 Peter uh, 2, and, uh, 2 and 1, the Bible says there would be some that would deny the Lord that bought them. So even though they had been bought by the Lord Jesus Christ, they would deny him. So I want you to remember this. The Bible says, To him that knoweth to do good, and doth it not to him, it is a sin. He's referring to you and I as Christians. A Christian, when you know that something is not right and you do it anyway, it becomes a sin. And so as Christians, you and I need to consider just a few thoughts here. What does sin do to me? Well, let's, let's consider that I was saved when I realized that the Lord Jesus had died for my sins and that he rose again on the third day. Let's consider that we repented, we received Christ as our Savior, and then, of course, we were reconciled to God. We are now forgiven. We are, have been forgiven. We have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. We are now sealed with the Holy Spirit of God. We're filled with the Spirit of God. And not only that, the Bible teaches you that you and I, little by little, as you, as you got, once you got saved, little by little, some a little faster than others, you're being transformed into the image of His Son, little by little. So the Bible says, that ought to be my goal. I want to be more like Jesus, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection. I, I should want, I should have a desire in my heart to be more like the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when, when we get saved, we, we say to ourselves, you know, I, I'm going to start serving God and I'm going to do the right thing. Now, there's a great sins that you and I uh, don't like. And when somebody preaches on it, especially if you're doing it, it bothers you and you get mad at the pastor because he preached on sin and, and, and you're, you're committing it. And so uh, some people say, well, you shouldn't preach on, on drunkenness or you shouldn't preach on, 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 on adultery, uh, sexual perversion, or you should not preach uh, against cursing or you should not. Well, then I wouldn't be preaching at all. I mean, I got to preach on something. And the Bible tells me that those are things you and I need to learn uh, need to learn, let's put it this way, to, to do right on. But there's other things that you and I uh, don't do right with. For example, prayer. You know you ought to pray, but you don't pray to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him. It is a sin. Studying your Bible. Being faithful. Uh, going soul winning. Living the right kind of life. Those are things we ought to be doing anyways. Now, having said all that, let me tell you this to you. So when we don't, and let's assume that your sin is greater than what I just mentioned. Let's assume that it's in your life there's adultery. Let's assume today that in your life there's things that ought not to be there. Maybe you curse. Maybe you steal. Uh, doing things like that that are going to send you to hell. You're doing those things and you say to yourself, I don't feel good. Well, let me share with you why we don't feel good. Let's consider what sin does to a Christian. First of all, sin... What will sin do to a Christian? Sin will rob a Christian from spiritual joy. God wants you and I to have joy. As a matter of fact, I want you to go, to, if you would, to the book, of, uh, uh, the book of Psalms 51, and I'll get there in just a minute. But while you're turning there, remember that Jesus said, my joy, I want my joy to remain with you in, in John 15, 11. In John 16, 24, he said, and you ask me what you want, and I'm going to answer your prayer so that your joy may remain in you. Again, he gives us the same thought. In Galatians 5, 22, the Bible says that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy. Now, the word joy is stuck in there. Why? Because God wants you and I to enjoy our Christian life. 
But I want you to notice the psalmist and what he says here as we begin to look at the, the, the writer of Psalm here. He says, he begins in verse 1 by simply saying this, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot or erase my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly with, from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I have acknowledged my transgression and my sin is ever before me. Against thee and only thee have I sinned, and, and, in, and in thy sight, behold, excuse me, and in thy sight. Now, I like that because he's, clean. he's telling God, Lord, I need to be clean from my sins. But here's why. If you look carefully to some of the things that he begins to say, and then he, he, he uh, as he, as he uh, uh, talking to the Lord, excuse me, he says, Behold, I was shaped in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive, conceive me. Then he says, Purge me with hyssop, that I may be clean. Wash me that I, that I shall, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me, watch carefully, make me to know the joy of my salvation. Then he goes in verse, look at verse 11. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me, look at verse 12, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Now notice that the psalmist, as he's, as he's uh, 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 writing this psalm, he's saying, Lord, restore to me the joy of thy salvation. I want the joy of my Christian life again. Now, realize that when you're saved, you have joy, you're enjoying your Christian life, you're having a great time with the Lord, but all of a sudden you find yourself backslid. You find yourself doing the wrong thing. Your life becomes bitter. The preaching is not what it used to be. Every sermon the preacher preaches, the preacher can get up here and preach against, uh, preach against chewing gum in church and you're going to get mad at them. Why? Because you're mad because they're, uh, they're sin in your life and you're bitter. When you get bitter, uh, it, it won't be long before uh, you, you, become, you start fighting. Then you start hating. And then you start sowing discord. Then you got conviction. Then you got guilt. And it's not long before you say, you know, I'm not coming to church anymore. And instead of getting closer to God, you get away from God. Why? Because sin will take away your joy. You can't rejoice in the beautiful music. You can't rejoice in the good preaching. You can't rejoice in a good revival when there is sin in your life. You can't do it. Why? Because sin steals the joy, the spiritual joy that you and I have to have. Sin also will rob a Christian from the presence of God. Now I want you to notice the psalmist, said, the psalmist in Psalm 52 says, Cast me not away from thy presence. Cast me not away from thy presence. I think about that and I want you to consider we begin to lose the presence of God. In Psalm 51, look at verse 11. When he asked the Lord, don't cast me away from thy presence. Proverbs 28 and 9. He that covers his sin shall not prosper, but whosoever confesses and forsakes it shall find mercy. In Proverbs 66, 18, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Psalms 59, verse 1 and 2, it tells us there that our sins have separated between us and our God, and he will not hear it. What happens is simply this, the presence of God. Amen? I, I'm going to say to you today that I think all of us, need to understand that the presence of God in my life and in your life is a privilege. God wants a fellowship with me. God wants a fellowship with you. And so what happens is sin begins to, sin begins to destroy that fellowship. Now, uh, now we say, well, I, I used to want to pray. I used to want to meditate. I used to want to worship. All of that, you can't enjoy it anymore. The presence is not there. You don't feel the presence of God. When you're serving uh, you don't feel the way you used to feel. Why? The presence of God is not there. When Adam and Eve sinned against the Lord, the Bible says that immediately they were trying to hide from God. What happened? They had such a good fellowship. Why are you even running from God instead of to God? Because remember that sin will takes away that fellowship and pretty soon instead of getting close to God, you start running from God. That's what begins to happen to them. They became rebellious and they became, uh, they got away from the Lord instead of closer to the Lord. Let, let me give you another one real quickly. Sin, well, robs a Christian from his fellowship with God. Now, what do I mean by my fellowship? The Bible says, draw nigh unto God and he will draw nigh unto you. How am I going to draw nigh to God? By wash your hands, you sinner. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Sin takes away the fellowship between me and God. You adulterers and adulteresses, the Bible says in James chapter 4 and verse 4, know you not 
that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. The friendship of the world. When I have to have the world, when I love the world, I'm becoming the enemy of God. What's happening to me and God? We don't have the same fellowship. Like Adam and Eve, we start running. We don't have that fellowship that we used to have. Let me explain what I mean by that because sometimes you and I don't understand the importance of a good fellowship with God. Uh, when you and I have, when, when we have a fellowship with God, there's such a confidence in your life and in my life because God is walking with us. I often tell the story of when I was a little kid. We used to, we grew up uh, right across the street, actually, well, right, uh, one, one, uh, one, uh, 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 a little bit far, far from, well, let's just say across, one, across a field from the cemetery. Okay, now I got it. Across a field from a cemetery. Sometimes I would go down my cousin's house, my cousin Jesse, and I'd hang out with him for a little while. And next thing you know, I'm trying to get home, but I was so scared because I'm trying to walk across, I'm trying to walk uh, by the street, right around the street. There's a cemetery right across the street. There's a cemetery, and I'm trying to walk by myself. I'm a little guy. I'm scared to death. And people would say, don't point at it. If you point at it, you better bite your finger because otherwise you're going to see the devil out there. I mean, all kinds of weird stuff like that. And you get scared as a little kid. I can remember one time I called and my dad said, all right, I'll wait for you by that little school. There was a little school uh, just past the cemetery uh, across the street from my cousin's house. And so I go to the school and there's my dad. You know, when I was walking with my dad by that cemetery, you know that I didn't have any fears of the cemetery? I could look, I could point, I didn't care. Why? Because I had a, my dad was right there next to me. Our Heavenly Father wants to walk with us. And sin will destroy that fellowship, and it ought to be a sweet fellowship. A sweet fellowship between you and the Lord. But sin is destructive. Boy, he takes away that fellowship, and now you don't have what you used to have in the things of God. And I, I'm going to say this, though. I don't have time to go through all of this, but let me say this to you, and I, I do want you to please listen to this. Sin not only takes a fellowship from you and I uh, with the Lord, not only does it destroy our fellowship, it steals our spiritual joy and the presence of God in your life and in my life, but sin will rob a Christian from things that are precious to him. Did you hear me? Things that are precious to you. Sin will take them from you. Let me, let me explain what I mean. You remember David? He seen a sin with Bathsheba. Then all of a sudden, he lost his son that, that, that they had. He, they lost their son. And I can re, I, I, if you look at the Bible, if you remember and, and go through the Bible, do you remember that he was fasting and praying and hoping that God would not take the child? But God took the child. Sin takes away precious things from us. If you don't believe that, then you can say, David, uh, not only did it destroy him, but it destroyed his family, his children. Samson lost his power because of sin. Samson lost his power. And can I say, David could not build a temple. Saul could not build a kingdom. Why? Why can't, why can't I build? Uh, why, can't, excuse me, why can't I be the king? Uh, God said, because of sin, Saul, because you disobeyed me, I'm going to take away the kingdom. Uh, I said, David could not build a temple. I'm sorry. David could not build a temple. Adam and Eve lost the garden. Moses lost the promised land because he disobeyed the Lord and didn't do what God had told him to do. Eli lost his children. Why? Because his sin that came into his life. Can I say to you today, and please listen, you need to be careful because sin is very, very destructive in your life. It is destructive in your life. It is destructive in your children, in your children's life. And then can I say sin robs a man from the service he ought to be doing for God. From the service he ought to be doing for God. A good example is 2 Timothy. I'm going to show you something. In 2 Timothy, the Bible says this. Now watch carefully. In 2 Timothy chapter 2. If you're trying to find it, 2 Timothy chapter 2. Uh, and the Bible said, the Bible teaches you and I that you and I are soldiers of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're to be serving the Lord Jesus Christ. But look at verse 19. Nevertheless, the, foundations, uh, the foundation of God standeth sure. Having this seal, the Lord knoweth those that are his, and let everyone that nameth the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. But in a great house, <clears throat> but in a great house, he says, not only, uh, excuse me, but, but in a great house, there's not only vessels of gold and silver, those are the Christians that are doing good, but also of wood and of earth. Some to honor, some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, 
He shall, watch carefully, he shall be a vessel under honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. I'm going to say this, this evening, or this morning, excuse me, I'm going to say to all of you that sin will rob you from the service of God. Here's a person that perhaps used to teach a Sunday school class, doesn't teach it anymore due to sin. Here's a preacher that can't preach anymore due to sin. Here's a choir member that used to sing in the choir or, or sing specials at the church or run the bus ministry. Now he's, out, now he's out. Why? Because of sin that came into his life. And it robbed him from the service of God. I think about that because when I was a young Christian, I was real young and I could remember that I, uh, I got, uh, uh, there was something, something in my life that just was not right. And, and I said, well, uh, now like most Christians, I know you guys don't do this, but like most Christians, Every so often, I would get into a little bit of a, of a scuffle. I don't mean fight, but I mean, you know, uh, back and forth with my wife. I don't like you. I like you less. You know, one of them things. And boy, we got into one of those things. And I said, you know what? I got no business running a bus ministry. I got no business teaching my Sunday school class because of sin. Boy, I, I, this is just no good. And I was all discouraged. And, and I remember I'm driving around. I stopped and I got into a phone booth and I called Joe Plumley, who was the deacon and the Sunday school superintendent at that time of the Shafter Free Will Baptist Church. I called Brother Joe and I said, Brother Joe, I just want you to know that I'm not teaching my class anymore. I'm not going to run the bus ministry anymore. He said, well, what's going on, Brother Patrick? What's the matter? And I said, well, there's some things in my life that shouldn't be there and they're there. It's just sin. That's all. Just sin. And I'll never forget what he said to me. He said, Brother Pat, can I ask you something? I said, what's that? He goes, why don't you quit on sin instead of quitting on God? Well, I never thought of that. That's deep. <laughs> Why don't you quit on sin instead of quitting on God? And so what I decided, I said, wait a minute, that's right. Why don't I quit on sin instead of quitting on God? I'm simply saying, people, if you're not careful, sin is going to rob you from the service you're doing to the Lord. Pretty soon you're not going to serve God the way you used to serve God. You're not going to do what you used to do when it came to the service of the Lord. And then sin robs a Christian from a longer life. Wait a minute, you mean I can die before my time? That's what the Bible says. In the book of Ecclesiastes, the Bible teaches you and I that you and I can die before our time. Actually, the Bible says this. Be not over much wicked. That's, by the way, Ecclesiastes 7, verse 17. Be not over much wicked, neither be, excuse me, neither be thou foolish. For why shouldest thou die before thy time? You remember in the book of Acts, Ananias and Sapphira, I think they died before their time. Sin can rob you of a longer life. Cut your life short. In, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 30, uh, during the Lord's Supper, many because of the misuse of the Lord's Supper, the Bible says many are sick and some even sleep. They died. And then it tells the young children. It tells the young children in Ephesians 6 and verse 1 that they are to honor their parents that they may live long upon the earth or their life may be, may be long upon the earth. I'm simply saying some people die before their time. Some people die before their time. When you look at Amnon, the Bible says that Amnon, of course, raped his sister and, and, and excuse me, after, yeah, Amnon raped his sister and Absalom had him killed. Now, wait a minute. He could have lived longer but he was killed by his brother because he raped his sister. Now, let me illustrate for you to, to make it. If you read it carefully, you're going to find in, in, second, in second Samuel 13 and 3, the Bible says Amnon had a friend. In the epitaph of every drug addict, of every drunkard, of every backslider, uh, of every preacher, of every anybody that you find gone astray, you can put this, Amnon had a friend, or so-and-so had a friend, or this guy had a friend. And they, what they did, they got you to sin to the point that now you're gone. Some people die early. I've been to funerals. I can give you so many just in the, in the last few years I've been in Salina. The people that have passed away, and I went to the funeral, they were so young. The kids running around, and you go, man, those kids were theirs. And, and now they're gone. And just young people, sin, cut their life short. I can show you people who used to go to church, quit going to church, and sin cut their life short. It does happen. Sin can rob a Christian of a longer life. Sin can rob a Christian 
of a longer life. Now, having given you all these thoughts that I gave you just in just a few minutes, let me remind you, sin will rob you of your spiritual joy. Sin will take a Christian and he'll take the presence of God with you. He'll take the fellowship of the Lord away from you. He will take things that are precious from you. He'll take the service of God from you. But also sin not only can cut your life short, but let me give you the last one here. Sin can rob a Christian of his heavenly home. God wants you to go to heaven. There's no getting around that. God wants you to go to heaven. Matthew chapter 5. I'm going to try to hurry a little bit here. Matthew chapter 5. When you read Matthew chapter 5, you've got to take the context for what it says. And I want you not to miss it here because in Matthew chapter 5, if you were to go to verse, uh, verse 1, of course, he takes his disciples. The Bible says, And seeing the multitude, he went away into the mountain. And when his disciples had come unto him, he, he opened his mouth and taught them. Who's he teaching? The disciples. He's teaching the disciples. Now, I, I want you to understand that because keep in mind that some people don't believe he is. But he says to them, you are the light of the world. He's teaching the disciples. When you pray, when you fast, in chapter 6, he's still teaching. He's teaching, the, he's still teaching his disciples. And as you go through this whole thing, he's teaching his disciples over and over. You'll find that the lesson Jesus is giving here is not being given to the unsaved, but to the saved. And look at verse uh, 20. In verse 20, he says, For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Sin will take the kingdom of heaven from you. Oh, Brother Pat, that's not what it says. Sure it does. If, yeah, but that, there's, a, there's a difference between being a Christian and being converted. Who told you that? Jesus didn't. In Matthew, chapter, in Matthew chapter 18 and verse 3, Jesus grabbed a little child. He said, unless you be converted, as a little child, you shall in no wise enter the kingdom of heaven. So no, Jesus didn't teach you that. <clears throat> Let me hurry up a little bit here. He says to them in verse 20, But I say to you that except your righteousness shall exceed the, the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you shall in no wise enter the kingdom of heaven. The Bible says the unrighteous, who are the unrighteous? The adulterer, the drunkard, shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. And such were some of you. You used to be that way. That means you're not no more. But now you have been justified. You've been sanctified by the Spirit of our God. Let me give you a couple of more. Judas, Jesus promised him. Uh, excuse me. He was part of those that was ordained. Now, I don't believe Jesus would ordain an unsaved man. But he ordained Judas. And he also tells them that he had given power over devils and enough power to raise the dead. Jesus did that. Now, either he was lying to Judas or Judas was saved. We can go on. There's a lot on Judas that we can go on. I don't have time. I realize that. In the book of Revelations, the Bible says this. But the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and the murderers. Oh, the unbelieving? Yeah. The unbelieving, that's the unsaved, and the fearful and the abominable also, and the murderers also. You remember that Jesus, uh, John said to the, to the Christians, if you hate your brother without a cause, you don't have eternal life. All right? You're a murderer, and you know no murderer, not even you, have eternal life. He goes on to say, liars shall put to have their place in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone. You see, people, the most dangerous thing of sin is not only that sin can rob your spiritual joy and the presence of God, which we ought to desire, a fellowship with our Heavenly Father, which we ought to desire. Not only will sin rob you and I from things that are precious, things that are precious to you and I. Sin will rob you from your service to the Lord. Sin, will, uh, sin if you would, will rob you from a longer life, but it will rob you from your heavenly home. You will be like Judas. You will kiss the door of heaven. And go to hell. You see, the Bible teaches you and I that the man that finds himself backslidden and living in sin is not going to go to heaven. So sin will rob you of that which God had given you. You say, well, isn't eternal life eternal? Yes, if you are in the Lord Jesus Christ. God didn't just throw it out there. Christ didn't just throw it out there. My sheep hear my voice and they follow me. And I am giving them eternal life. That's what the verse really says. 
And, I'm, and I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. But he said, a stranger they will not. My sheep won't follow a stranger. So you can c conclude two things. Either you were never saved, or the backsliders going to hell. <laughs> the backs People, I'm going to say to you today, it is sad. I realize that. But there's a lot of people that should have gone to heaven that won't go to heaven. Because they turned on the Lord. As I said this morning during the, uh, the Sunday school lesson, they deny the Lord that bought them. And Jesus said, if you'll deny me, I'm going to deny you. They deny the Lord that bought them. That's what sin does. He said, well, I never said I don't love Jesus. You don't have to deny him like that. By our works, we deny him. By our ungodliness, we deny him. And so if you're, if you're there today, you find yourself as a Christian, but you find yourself in sin, don't let the devil keep that sin in your life that will rob you from all the things that are precious that God wants in your life. Don't let the devil keep those in your life and destroy your life. Our Father, we thank you, Lord, for the day. We thank you, Heavenly Father, Lord, because we know that we have a God that is a forgiving God, a merciful God. And Lord, may we find it in our hearts to repent to receive the Lord and say, Lord, we're sorry for our sins and get our hearts right where they ought to be. We love you, we praise you, and we thank you so much. In Christ's name.